You know, we are seeing 33% in London, 33% of trips made by foot, 45% in Paris, 31% in New York City. So we are seeing a lot of people choosing alternative modes. Alternative modes of transport are popular, but it's about uh, the, the, the disproportionate impact that cars are having. So just uh, putting those stats next to each other there can encourage some conversation around that. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel and season four of the Active Towns podcast. I'm John Zimmerman and that was Amelia Hanna with Car Free Megacities an NGO nonprofit based out of the UK uh, that is challenging three mega cities, New York, Paris, and London, uh, to do what they can to become less car dependent. It's a fascinating interview, and I hope you enjoy this episode with Amelia. I am absolutely delighted to have Amelia uh, here in the podcast here today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Well, speaking of here, obviously we're we're meeting and connecting here virtually. Where on earth are you? Well, I'm actually based in Edinburgh, up in up in Scotland, but I'm the campaign manager for Car Free Megacities, which is a collaboration between London, New York, and Paris. So, yes, the the joys of uh, connectivity and, and being able to coordinate across the globe. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fantastic. And uh, I, I did see that we had a little bit of freezing there in frame. So we're going to roll with this and see how we do. And hopefully it'll all be fine. Uh, otherwise, we might have to borrow the, the neighbor's uh, stronger Wi-Fi <laughs> or stronger Internet connection. But uh, yeah, it's it's such a pleasure to, to connect with you. Um, and I got connected with you through Doug Gordon, uh, who is the uh, co-host of the War on Cars podcast. And uh, he was uh, gracious enough to be uh, on my podcast a couple of times. He did a live streaming event for me to close out season three. So hopefully every ha everybody had a chance to, to view that. Um, but uh, how is it that you know Doug Gordon? So Doug is actually the New York lead for Car Free Megacities. Um, and Car Free Megacities is a collaboration between partners in New York, London, and Paris. Um, and what the campaign essentially is trying to do is to reimagine these iconic cities as free from car dependency. So, um, yeah, Doug, uh, we got in touch with Doug. Um, obviously, he is a leading voice uh, on things in the States, and it's fantastic to have him on board. Yeah, for sure. And I love the way that you frame that, too, because you, you said, you know, uh, basically a cities, uh, mega cities that are being you know free of car you know, dependency. And so I think that's a that's a really important factor to, to understand that, uh, you know, just like the quote unquote war on cars, you really it, that's a tongue in cheek you know, phrase to begin with, but really it's all about trying to have a war on car dependency and continuing to build uh, our cities in, in such a way where there is no other choice, the, you know, but to be dependent on cars. Uh, now, the, your organization that you're, you're part of is is possible. We are possible. Uh, talk a little bit about that, that overarching organization um, and, and sort of where that's based and everything. Sure. Yeah. So possible UK based climate charity um, and its aim is to bring people together to take positive action to tackle climate change, um, but also to focus on system change as well. Oh, there goes my cat along the way. Sorry. About oh, that. hi, kitty. <laughs> <laughs> little cat, little Hobbs wants to get involved as well in the podcast. Um, but yeah, so so possible. Uh, the aim is really to empower and inspire people to take action on the climate crisis. I think it's very easy for people maybe to feel like they don't know how to get involved, maybe slightly despondent. But really what we aim to do is to empower people to, to make a change themselves, but also to tie that in with broader system change. And that's exactly what the Car Free Megacities campaign is all about. It's about saying, you know, we 
would like to encourage people to try to go car free if they can. But we recognize that there are systemic barriers in the way that, that prevent people from doing that. So really, we're also pointing the finger uh, at the three mayors of London, New York and Paris to say, hey, come on, what are you going to do to tackle the dominance of cars in these three cities? Uh, there's a lot that the cities can learn from each other. So the aim of the campaign really is to create a bit of a healthy competition to point out where each city has got it right, but also to push for, for greater ambition. So, so yeah, it's, it's about empowering people on the one hand, but also pointing the finger of responsibility firmly where it lies, which is with our town planners, with our politicians to, to basically free us from the shackles of car dependency. Yeah, yeah. And we see that travel is, in fact, one of these six major areas uh, that is outlined here on the website. And when we, you know, when we drop in on on the travel area, you know, we, we get to see, you know, yeah, that we understand that. Um, in many of these cities, uh, when we look at the the car and uh, the impact that it's having on the climate, on emissions, you're looking at travel is responsible for 40 percent of all emissions in the UK. Very similar numbers in these other mega cities as well. And uh, you, then this is really focused on, you know, what you can do, what, you know, some of the, you know, speaking to the individuals that there are, you know, things that can be done um, to, to make a difference. And one of the, the cool things that I love about uh, the, your website, uh, the possible website, right when you get to it, and we're going to pop over to the uh, uh, the Mega Cities website in just a moment and look at some dashboards. But uh, right at the very, very top of the, the main page is, is this little statement or this little question is, are you ready to go car free? I love it. I, it's like it's almost hidden up, uh, underneath there. But if you click on that a little bugger, it, it starts talking about. Uh, you know, what individuals can do to, you know, to start heading into becoming car free in 2022. And I think it's just so incredibly important that people feel like there is something that they can do. And oftentimes it's just some simple things that they can, you know, go, you know, the, the way that they, there's some that are more complicated, <laughs> like changing the infrastructure in their community, uh, but other things that they can do within their own lives. Speak to that a little bit, because I think that's important to, to you know, set up before we go into really looking at these more global uh, challenges of these mega cities. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, we want to, we really want to empower and encourage people to feel that they can make a change um, and to feel that they're part of the solution to the climate crisis. I think often it feels like something maybe that's far away from us or it's removed from us. Um, you know, we know that uh, system change is required, but really what Possible is aiming to do is to bridge that gap and um, to enable and encourage people to make a shift. So our going car free challenge there, uh, which you just uh, alluded to, um, was all about inviting people uh, through the month of July um, to take the challenge to go car free. Um, and our team was there to support people along the way. Uh, we had over a thousand people who responded, uh, who were interested in the campaign. Um, and the people who signed up, uh, you know, there were some really inspiring stories of people who had, you know, really been quite dependent on their cars, reliant on their cars, who were thinking, how am I going to get through this month? Um, but who actually found it to be surprisingly enjoyable and fun and people who who sort of thought, oh, I might continue to do this uh, because suddenly I'm taking in the, the sounds and the sights of my city in a way that I wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, I think though what's important to emphasize here is that the burden of tackling climate change shouldn't fall just on individuals. It's really important that we feel inspired and encouraged. But what we're doing by encouraging individuals to take action is trying to bridge that gap and, and connect the dots between what people can do and system change. So the other side of our work is to draw uh, attention of what people are doing, to, to, to draw that, to connect that 
those dots between people who are taking action and our politicians, because we need to be able to show our politicians that people are willing to make a change. We're asking for change, but it's down to our politicians to, to set up the infrastructure that can support that because it's not everybody who can go car free at the moment. And it's important to recognize that. Um, so it's it's about getting that balance right. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want to shame anybody who who is dependent on a car for whatever reasons. Uh, a lot of cities are not currently set up in a way that makes it easy for people to to get around without cars. However, uh, in cities like London, um, Bristol. Birmingham, Leeds, uh, where we did the Going Car Free Challenge, it was possible for, for people to take part and, and the results were really inspiring. Yeah, yeah. The, the reality is, is that uh, when we look at the number of trips, not looking, not honing in on commute trips, but the, the number of total trips um, throughout city after city after city, you know, on across the, around the globe, when we look at it, we realize that many of the trips, they can be you know, anywhere, you know, depending on where you're at from 35% to 45%, sometimes even 55% of all trips are actually within easy biking distance. And so it's like, oh, well, maybe maybe our, my commute is longer, but I have a whole bunch of other you know, trips that I take that are inherently bikeable. Um, so it, it kind of opens up the, the reality is like, oh, so if we only had safe places, safe networks to be able to, to ride, to be able to get there, uh, it really kind of opens up the world for them. And you're absolutely right. The, part of that quote, personal action that we can take is, you know, what are the steps that we can take to make more of our, our trips, you know, uh, by walking, biking and using transit um, and not being car dependent. But the other part is holding our politicians accountable is speaking up and making sure that they hear that this is something that's desirable from their constituents. Because if we allow the status quo, the noisy minority that really wants to hold on to car dependency, uh, and they're passionate about it, <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll tell, take all the air. And so it's, that's incredibly important. So I'm glad you, you mentioned that it's, it's both yeah. of those. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And I think we, we sort of, have got to a state of car dependency where we we sort of accept the status quo nearly. Well, we're we're, we're challenging challenging that obviously through our yeah. work, um, but where it's quite normal to accept that the dominant mode of, of transport in our cities is the car. And I think it's really important to uh, just to reframe the conversation to say, well, hang on a minute, why is this the case? Right. Uh, a lot of people don't want this to be the case. Uh, and and, it's not and the let's case. think. You know, Absolutely. It, I mean, in the case of New York, when we look at, because again, let's get to let's get to our three uh, mega cities that we're currently focusing on right now: London, Paris, and New York. Uh, pedestrians far outnumber the the number of motor vehicles in the city, but the but the motor vehicles have an inordinate negative uh, impact on the city in, in terms of, uh, you know, the impact on, you know, especially pedestrian fatalities, which we'll see in the, in the dashboard here real soon. Uh, talk a little bit about, um, the car frame mega cities campaign, how it got launched and, and how did you find your way to this? Well, yeah. So the, the campaign is a two year project. Um, and uh, Possible was doing quite a lot of work around car-free cities. Um, and really, I think it was Leo, uh, one of our co-directors, who had the idea of thinking, well, there, there are a lot of cities that are comparable. And the cities of London, Paris, and New York have a lot in common. So let's have a conversation. It's all about sort of having a conversation, creating healthy competition between these cities um, you know, seeing which city can come out on top, sort of having a bit of fun with it, um, having a bit of a challenge between these three cities and presenting it that way uh, and, and targeting it really at, at the mayors of those cities, because there's a lot that is uh, within our mayor's gift uh, to control. Um, and we thought that by bringing those three iconic cities together that are you know roughly comparable in terms of population, um, all three quite uh, iconic cities that people uh, love to live in and love to visit and enjoy, uh, and, and really having that conversation around 
the dominance of cars on our streetscape. But I see there that you're pulling up uh, the data dashboard. Uh, yes, cars dominate our streetscapes. But as we see from our data, the majority of people living in Paris, London and New York actually live without a car. So it's about opening up a conversation around uh, the equity uh, aspects of that and thinking, right, how can we redesign our cities for the future? How can we start to envision our cities for the future, given that we know that we have to tackle the climate crisis? Transport, uh, as you mentioned before, is one of those um, one of those sectors which just isn't seeing the reductions in carbon emissions that we need it to see. Yeah, yeah. And we thought that by presenting these three cities next to each other, we could um, we could really start to open up quite an interesting and fun discussion around that. Right. And off to the, the right on the graph here, we can see the population of the inner and outer metro areas here. So if we zoom in on this, we can kind of get a, a sense as to the, the scale that we're talking about, the number of people that we're, we're talking about here. So, for example, uh, you know, right there in that inner metro area, uh, you know, it, it's just a, a, like Paris is just a shade over uh, two million people in, in that area. So these really are mega cities. These are big, big cities um, that are that are out there. And I think that um, it's a little bit of an unfair competition in, in some ways, in the sense that uh, uh, especially when we compare the mayors, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, obviously, uh, the, the the mayor of New York is just come into 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 his administration. Um, mayor Hildago has been uh, in in the uh, in power for some time now, and just got reelected on a campaign of really taking bold bold moves. Um, and Sadiq Khan is 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 obviously, I think, in his second term as well. So. Uh, it seems like London and Paris have a little bit of a head, uh, head start here in some ways. But uh, when we look at some of the challenges that, that, are, are, that we're faced with, I was frankly a little shocked to see that on the tra traffic fatalities per year, um, London's really leading the way here in terms of the uh, fewer numbers. Uh, Speak to that a little bit. What what do you think is is going on here in in that sense? I mean, is this something that's more historical? Is there just less? Uh, maybe is it less number of motor vehicles, or is it less motor vehicles traveling at speed? I think it's due to a combination of factors. I mean, London uh, and across the UK. Um, there have been strategies in place to try to reduce traffic fatalities. So it could be that those numbers speak to that. Um, but I, I was also quite shocked to see the numbers for New York. And it's interesting to see that, uh, that campaigners in New York uh, who are tackling the dominance of cars in New York uh, are, are really having to, to point out a lot that um, traffic fatalities are such a, a huge and frequent tragedy that happens in in New York something really important to highlight and tackle yeah I mean it's just it, it's again I, I said it at the opening that you know in in Manhattan especially uh, which is really what we're talking about here is that inner inner city area um, we're, we're talking about it's like a 10 to one factor of the number of pedestrians outnumbering uh, the, the number of, of motor vehicles in the area. And when you see like a threefold increase, or, you know, larger number in terms of fatalities due to motor vehicles, you know, compared to London, uh, this should be embarrassing for, for New York. I mean, New York does has really, if you, you step back and look at it, there's no reason why anybody should have a motor vehicle in New York whatsoever. Um, that was said, you know, that said, uh, obviously, as you mentioned earlier, there are some people who may be dependent on, on, on a, a motor vehicle of some sort, uh, but certainly not a motor vehicle that has the capacity to kill. There, I no, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't have said it better. And I think, you know, is the, 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 the statistics speak for themselves. Every yeah. traffic fatality is one traffic fatality too many. Um, and, and that number should be zero for all cities. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I think it, it speaks to the fact that for far too long, um, 
people have maybe grown to 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 accept the status quo but uh one of the one of the purposes of this dashboard is to really highlight and to draw comparisons across the, the three cities in the way in a way that has impact. So I think that's it's really important that it does do that uh, and important to to get the word out across all of the statistics. Yeah, and let's let's take a, a moment to 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 get away from the actual traffic fatalities and talk a little bit about uh, fine particulate air per- pollution. And I was delighted to see this on here because one of the things that uh, many cities are are moving aggressively in, in Paris is, is one of the cities that is doing this and, and maybe London is too, of decreasing the number of uh, fuel bill- burning vehicles, um, gas burning vehicles, diesel burning vehicles, trying to eliminate them from their city centers uh, and really taking you know bold steps towards that climate change side, uh, which also does help you know, with uh, pollution in the air. I mean, Mary Hill Dog, it was uh, a wonderful quote from 2015 was like, hey, we've got so much smog in the city, we can't even see the Eiffel Tower. That's a problem. It is a problem. But I loved it that the, the fine particulate uh, air pollution was on here too, because this is one of the things that we te- keep talking about is that, hey, simply electrifying our fleet is not enough. We still have particulate from the, the the tires. We still have particulates coming off of the brake pads, and many other you know factors, including the uh, the 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 footprint of manufacturing all of these very very heavy uh, you know electric vehicles. And that's one of the things that I'm glad people are pointing out is that's an issue. So the fact that you also are measuring this, I think, is in- incredibly important because when we look at uh, disease, especially lung disease and other associated uh, challenges like asthma, this is the the, the bad boy in, in the room in terms of what happens. I shouldn't say in the room, it's out there. <laughs> so yeah. talk a little bit of, no, uh, to this as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I think it's really important to, to call a spade a spade when it comes to, to transport policy and, and to call out the impact that the private car is having um, on our cities, not just in terms of the climate crisis, but in, in terms of air pollution as well. Um, and so, yeah, this statistic does speak to that. We know that a lot of uh, uh, PM 2.5 uh, air pollution particulate matter does come from from um, brake wear, tire wear, as you mentioned. Um, and I think that's it's a very important part of the conversation and it's part of why I love this campaign um car free megacities is that I think often what we find is that there can be a tendency to uh, resort to techno fixes uh, to get us out of of a lot of the problems that we're facing um there can be a lot of uh, sort of narrative around oh well the electric car will solve everything now the ele- electric cars are going to be part of the solution but they're not the only solution. Um, and that that's so important uh, to for, for us to call out, um, not just because of the fine particle air pollution that they cause, but also because of other equity issues. They're not necessarily affordable. Um, they still take up a, a heap of, of a lot of space. Yep. Um, so I think by <laughs> and, and showing- they, And they'll still you know impact those numbers. <laughs> so, absolutely, yeah. they still kill, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Not good stuff. This is what we need to to to, to work on. Okay, green space. Well, absolutely, and I think it's you yeah. know it's it is um it's it's very easy with this work to to get bogged down in uh, talking about the problems that yeah. we have with cars, and it's it's really important to do that. I think and and a very very important part of the conversation. But certainly, what we're trying to do with the campaign as well is just to shift the conversation on a little bit and to say, well, the future can be car free. What does that future look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Um, Because actually, it's not just about dealing with with all of the terrible things that, that that come from cars, but also it's about enjoying and reaping the benefits that a car free future offers our cities. So so yeah, and, and I think the 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 green space, um, uh, 
piece there on the dashboard really speaks to that. Um, I think it's something that we really felt, particularly uh, here in the UK, uh, during some of the lockdowns, people were outside a lot more during lockdown. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and people sort of began to, to think, okay, what if, what if we didn't have cars on our streets? What would that be like? Actually, that could be quite a nice thing. Right. Yeah. It's interesting too, when I look at these three different graphics, uh, the thing that jumps out at me right away with, uh, with London, uh, having, you know, more per person, uh, you know, meters squared, is that what that is? Uh, and it's just the fact that it looks like there's just a really good coverage of smaller green spaces that, in other words, there's a shorter distance that somebody would need to walk or bike to be able to access green space. Am I interpreting this correctly? Yes, you are. Um, I, I think what we'd say from the London perspective is we need more. Um, and cars are, are still quite uh, right. dominant on our on our streetscapes, but but yes, and that green space was absolutely a lifeline to to people during the lockdowns and during the pandemic. Um, and and I think really what what people started to to feel uh, sort of through the pandemic and beyond was. Um, just how important accessing green space is not only for our physical health, but also for our mental health. Um, and we want to, we want to kind of take some of that momentum and continue that conversation in terms of framing it around, right. What about all these cars on our streets? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I, I, I recently had, uh, Dr. Billy Fields on, and, and we talked a little bit about, uh, uh, the work that he's been doing, the research that he's been doing down at Texas State University, and he just got through spending uh, over a month in Europe uh, looking at uh, some of the trends that we're seeing. And one of the things that he pointed out was the greening of streets that is taking place in Rotterdam and in Amsterdam and certain other places where it may not show up on a map like this that uh, uh, of, you know, this is green space, but taking definitive steps to add green to uh, what was previously motor vehicle travel lanes and motor vehicle parking spaces, you know, ripping that stuff up, putting in, uh, you know, parklets and, and, and planting more street trees and having uh, uh, rain gardens to be able to, to help do more filtration and, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're nodding going, yeah, <laughs> we got to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've seen a lot of that in, yeah. in London, um, in, in London, part of the, our car free cities campaigns work, um, is to encourage local councils, um, to support people to apply for parklets. So really to legitimize that process of taking parking spaces away from cars and giving them back to the community. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that, uh, parklets just, you know, a few meters of, of space, giving it back to the community and allowing communities to, uh, to put whatever they want there. Um, it really helps community cohesion. It brings communities together. Um, and it is part of that inspirational change that we can build on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Uh, you had alluded to it just a moment ago is the amount of space taken up by our cars. Walk us through our graphic here. Yeah, so what you see there uh, represented by uh, those circles is the, the footprint. So if you squeezed all the cars together in each city, um, that circle would represent the footprint that they take up. Um, so you can see, for example, for London, pretty much the whole of... of um, the the city of London area there, um, so yeah, we we just wanted to to shine a light um, on the fact that that is that's you know quite a lot of space uh, equivalent to a couple of Richmond parks put together, um, and again just open up the conversation, invite people to to reimagine how would we how would we like that space to be used, um, how would we want it to feel, so. Yeah, just just again highlighting the dominance of cars in our cities, um, and and inviting people to reimagine a, a different future. 
Yeah. And I think it's important too, to, to, to point out that uh, these percentages of the total city area might seem a little small, and they are because you have to think about the fact that this is really looking at the entire city area. If you walk outside most <laughs> your house and, and look at what you know the average percentage uh, is taking up by um, you know in public space, not private property, but public property, uh, that percentage is much greater. You're looking at anywhere between 30, 40, maybe even 50%. I'm looking at you, Houston, <laughs> and others uh, that are taken up by lanes and parking, especially surface parking lots. So uh, I just wanted to point that out is that, you know, that percentage is actually much greater when you, uh, especially in North America, if you step outside your door and, and look at what this what the space looks like. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the impacts here. Uh, the lost time during rush hour and uh, a number of trips made on foot and the number of trips made in uh, public transport and on the bicycle. Yeah. So I guess here we just uh, so we've got our statistics showing um, that. Uh, that drivers are losing over a hundred hours um, in rush hour traffic, just sat behind the wheel um, in all of our three mega cities. And I think that's, it's really important to focus on the fact that um, the dominance of the car in our cities is not just a problem for people who don't have a car uh, it's not just a nuisance for those people, but it's it's a nuisance for people who are reliant on cars as well. Um, nobody likes sitting in traffic. Um, nobody likes being caught in congestion. It's frustrating. Um, but it can't go on this way. So I think it's, it's kind of, a, I think it was Brent uh, Todorian who, um, who said that, you know, if you design a city for, for drivers, it doesn't work for anybody, right. including drivers. Yeah. Um, and, and I think those congestion statistics really show that. Um, but also what we wanted to highlight here is the flip side of the story that, you know, we are seeing, um, you know, 33% in London, 33% of trips made by foot, 45% in Paris, 31% in New York City. So we are seeing a lot of people choosing alternative modes. Alternative modes of transport are popular, um, but it's about uh, the, the, the disproportionate impact that cars are having. So just uh, putting those stats next to each other there um, can encourage some conversation around that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, really, I, I view the bicycle as, as one of the, you know, magic pills that are out there, just in the sense that you're able to travel a significant distance distance, further distance than, uh, let's say, walking. So that combination of public transport, which we see up there uh, on the right of the screen, in combination with the bicycle is one of those magic combinations because you can, you know, ride your bike to a transit stop, lock your bike up, jump on transit, get to your destination, get a bike share, you know, a bike sharing system scheme and, and jump on a bike share and go to your final destination. And suddenly you've expanded your range ninefold, you know, maybe your, your walking limitations, you know, when you got to your destination off, off of transit was, you know, somewhere between a half mile to a mile, and then you're kind of pushing it, but you know, it's legitimate for you to jump on a bike share or have a second bike in the, your destination, especially if this is a commute, this is a normal trip that you're doing. Uh, suddenly, you know, very, very comfortable going uh, anywhere between three and five, maybe even six miles, you know, up, up to that 10 kilometer mark is is like a legitimate ride. Uh, and especially if your bike share is electrified, which I understand that's that's happening in London right now. So that's good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's, yeah, bikes are such a game changer. And Paris is actually a really interesting city in terms of biking. I was just there a couple of months ago and I was absolutely astounded by how good the cycling infrastructure uh, is, is coming along in Paris. They, um, 
through lockdown, they rolled out uh, tens and tens and dozens of kilometers of, of cycling infrastructure, and that that is set to increase. Um, they removed cars from the Rue de Rivoli, which is like one of the main um, thoroughfares across Paris. Cars were removed. Um, and that became very popular for bikes. Uh, and, and it is beginning to feel a lot more like a Copenhagen, like an Amsterdam. I could really feel that change um, from the previous time that I'd been to Paris, which was 10 years prior, where I was so terrified using my bike across the city center that I actually hopped on a train um, because it, it was just too intimidating. Um, so, so Paris is really coming in leaps and bounds uh, in terms of supporting cycling infrastructure. It's really exciting to see, uh, you know, just dozens and dozens of people out on their bikes across the streets of Paris. Um, it, it, it's really changing the the, the visual landscape of, of Paris for sure. Yeah, and uh, and when you see numbers like this, and it, it, you, you really start to understand and appreciate because bike sharing again might be that that trip where it's like, oh yeah, I get off a of transit. I'm going to get on a, on a bike share, but it could also be a more um, spontaneous trip. It could be a tourist. It could be some, some, a, a local, you know, coming out of a pub with some friends and going, Hey, let's head on over and, you know, grab drinks uh, or, or, or dinner down the way. And so, yeah, let's jump on the bike share and take off. Huge. I mean, that's just a, a, a massive improvement. Um, and, it's it's really about a having the scheme in place, having the system in place, so that it is convenient, and uh, it, it's something that you know folks feel like okay, this is a good value too. It's not I'm not going to go broke by using the bike share system, and uh, and then again infrastructure. Do I have a safe route to be able to get to those meaningful destinations? And I'm, I'm jealous. I haven't had a chance to get back to Paris since 2015. I was there for the very first car-free day uh, that Mayor Hildago did uh, on September, I think it was 27th, 2015. And um, I wanted to be able to film before, during, and after to, to really get a sense as to, to the impact. So I'm dying to get back there. Maybe later yeah. this year, maybe next year. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely incredible to to sort of witness this change that's happening. And I think one of the things um, that that we can see uh, and that we saw through through the pandemic is that change can happen quite quickly. Um, uh, and again, with this campaign, Car Free Megacities, we are encouraging our politicians to be bold, to be radical, to take those steps that maybe feel more intimidating than they need to feel. Um, and, and I think Paris is quite a good example of that. So we now um, know that Paris is planning to ban uh, non-essential traffic in its city center by 2024. Um, that's that's huge yeah. and that, that's going to have a dramatic impact on the way that people get around um and i think we we want to continue that competition and to point out that change doesn't have to be scary uh right. i think what we've seen uh, time and time again um w with not just our mega cities but other cities that have introduced uh, measures, whether be it pedestrianization or cycle lanes, uh, we've often seen that people can be a little bit afraid, a little bit intimidated um, and worried about what impact these changes will have on them before the changes are brought in. But then once the changes are brought in, they're very popular. So, you know, the Netherlands outrage uh, when plans were brought in to 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 do the cycle lanes there in the center of Amsterdam. But now, you know, people wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so, you know, we're seeing that that often, even though change, there's resistance to change, often those changes are supported uh, after they are introduced. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure that we had a chance to talk about uh, noise and mm -hmm. uh, the impact that that really cars have on cities. Uh, one of the great quotes uh, 
from, uh, it's been going around. Many people have said it, but uh, um, my, my good friends, Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, uh, wrote a book uh, called Curbing Traffic, and they have an entire chapter on noise. And the reality is, is that um, cities aren't inherently noisy. Cars make cities noisy. <laughs> um, and what I like about all of these things that we've been talking about here is that it seems like we're like, we're beating up on cities and beating up on cars. Um, but really the point of like looking at this stuff is, is to point out just how wonderful cities could be. And, uh, going back to the pandemic again, um, when motor vehicle levels, uh, driving levels decreased, all of a sudden you could hear birds in cities. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, I'm so I was delighted to see that that was uh, one of the, the the criteria that y'all are looking at. So um, take it away. Talk, talk a little bit about why you've included noise in. Yeah, these metrics. absolutely. I mean, noise pollution does not get a lot of airtime, but um, when we think about it, if you step out into into many modern cities, you have that constant hum of cars. Um, Noise pollution is one of the biggest threats to to health, it, it, certainly in Europe. And um, we put together these maps uh, in conjunction, working together with Jetpack AI, um, a data sonification uh, company. Uh, so we put together these maps. And what's really cool about these maps is that you can actually click on them. They're interactive maps uh, using using public publicly available data. And they show you what the level of noise is uh, uh, along many roads uh, in our three mega cities. And what we're seeing is that the noise levels are actually in breach of World Health Organization um, guidance levels. So what we're pointing out here is that we, we, we have a big problem with noise pollution in our cities. It's caused by cars. And as you were saying, we want to take pride in our cities. We're, we are proud of our cities. Um, we want to celebrate the best that they have to offer. And we just need to call out the fact that cars are causing uh, the, the problem of noise pollution uh, to make the case for, for just how, how our cities could sound without all that noise. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not to get too far into the weeds, but from a public health perspective, uh, we do know that uh, ambient noise and specifically mechanical noise, noise from motor vehicles, does have a deleterious effect on health. Um, we are seeing increases in uh, blood pressure, increases in heart attack rates, increased stroke. Uh, these are all well-studied concepts. So it's it's not as just as innocuous as, oh, well, it just blends into the background. It, it really, especially if you have disruption of sleep patterns, it can be incredibly uh, deleterious to, to health. So uh, you mentioned that these are interactive. Can I actually just click on this and it'll do something? <laughs> Uh, you should be able to, um, okay, let's, hopefully, let's I'm that. not sure if it'll work with the podcast recording, but you should be able to <laughs> click on it. Um, let's, let's see what happens here. So, oh yeah, look at this. See what okay. happens. Okay, and with sound, so let's turn up the sound on the iPad here, and let's do with sound. This is cool. So if I zoom in, will that do anything different? Uh, have, a, have a little go. I think if you hover your cursor over where, uh, so the points in color there are, are where we were able to get data for, Got and it. that should show you the sound, the sound levels. Wow. Um, so again, just highlighting the fact that cars are the reason for this. We've accepted this as the norm for for far too long. Yeah. But the future, we want to, to we want the future to be car free. We want the future to be better. Yeah. Um, and and tackling tackling the dominance of the car will tackle the problem of noise pollution in our cities. Yeah. Um, our cities could be quieter. They could be calmer, more peaceful. Um, you know, a lot of the time, I think with people are maybe sitting thinking about going on city breaks, they think, oh, you know, I might go to Copenhagen because there aren't very many cars there. Um, 
we we're looking for an escape for the car. So let's challenge the status quo and, and get there by putting the pressure on our mayors. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the leaderboard to see where we're at here. Uh, so we got the car free mega cities leaderboard on the cargo bikes uh, area. It looks like Paris is leading the way. Talk a little bit about this. Yeah, absolutely. So cargo bikes, um, have been a, a really important game changer in terms of um, displacing trips that need to, that could be taken otherwise by vans. Um, we've also done research into cargo bikes that, that show that in London as well, they have a, a big potential to, to displace uh, the trips that need to be done by vans. Um, and so, yeah, we just wanted to rank what the different cities were doing on them. And the award in this case went to Paris. Yeah. And specifically on cargo bikes, are, are you focusing in mostly on the logistical uh, delivery of packages, cargo bikes, or is uh, personally owned cargo bikes like for, for carting your children around? Uh, I'm thinking of like the, the typical uh, Dutch fo- uh, Bachvitz where the, the kids are in front. Is that also included in, in the cargo bikes here? I believe that data is not included in, in here. Okay. This so this is just, is just the logistics on, and trying to get yeah, packages yeah. delivered. Deliveries. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. All and right. it's, I think this is a really important part of the story is to, to um, allow people to imagine that, yes, we can do deliveries without cars. Mm-hmm. Um, it is being done with success and there is potential for improvement in this area. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting to see data uh, pulled out that includes personally owned cargo bikes. Uh, our, our household, we le- recently invested in a cargo bike uh, and it's really, right. you know, <laughs> helped eliminate a lot of trips. And so, you know, being able to, to you know, pick up heavier packages and being able to um, also uh, potentially not order from Amazon as much, you know, be able to, to, to go out and make those those shopping runs and feel like, yeah, I can carry, you know, many, many kilos or pounds worth of, of, of uh, stuff uh, on the, the cargo bike, uh, yeah. as well as, you know, being able to eliminate some potential trips uh, that are yeah, otherwise Yeah, yeah. They can be a, a total game changer and um, sort of going off on a bit of a tangent here. But um, uh, when I was in Paris, I actually saw somebody, uh, a, a bin man. So somebody collecting the uh, municipal rubbish on a bike, uh, yeah. on a cargo bike. And yeah. that was incredibly inspirational. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and routinely we see that in the Netherlands. I've seen it in Sweden. I've seen it in Denmark is that uh, the mail carriers, you know, that's what they're doing. That's how they're delivering the packages, delivering the mail is via cargo bike. So it's good stuff. Okay. Action during COVID. So uh, this is uh, pointing, I'm assuming, to some of the things that took place during the, the lockdown. Yes. And what I would say about this, our leaderboard of, of ranking the cities, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, you know, they're, all cities did take action yeah. during during lockdown. But what the aim here is just to create a little bit of healthy competition between our cities. Um, there was a lot that all that all three cities did. So in London, we saw the big rise of the low traffic neighborhood, um, which are essentially um, where uh, Physical things, be it planters, um, use of curbsides are, are put in the road in order to discourage um, local neighborhoods being used as rat runs and, and in order to reduce traffic. Um, and and those were, were done with quite a high degree of success in London. Um, but I also want to point to, uh, to initiatives that were taken in Paris and New York as well during lockdown. So... Um, in Paris, as I mentioned earlier, the Rue de Rivoli was fully pedestrianized. There was a big rollout of, of bike lanes during lockdown. Uh, and in New York, obviously, we had uh, the open streets, the, the, the sort of the, the initiative which saw a, a lot of uh, streets being given back to people. Um, and we now have a campaign or, or there is a campaign in New York uh, which is calling for 25% of streets to be given back to people by 2025. And that actually does have the backing of the mayor. So a lot to congratulate uh, on all yeah. cities in terms of action taking taken during lockdown. Yeah, good stuff. I love it. And moving on to parklets. 
Ta-da, Parklets, London also. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so here we, we're seeing that um, London has done a lot to, to make it easier for people to apply uh, to, to actually legitimately take over a parking space and turn it into a parklet. So giving it back to the community uh, and Hackney Council uh, is currently trialing that at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. And, and going back to, we've got a couple of them uh, here on London with, with that. Uh, uh, it does remind me that uh, going back to the LTNs uh, and, and looking at uh, the response from, from COVID, uh, when I was speaking with Will Norman, we talked about that. And we also talked about the uh, School Streets program uh, that really sort of blossomed uh, coming out of, of COVID. I think there are well over 350 schools in their School Streets program where they're you know taking massive area, you know, really protective area around each school and cutting it off to, to that through traffic and really encouraging safer places for kids to be able to walk and bike to school. So uh, I that just popped into my head. So wanted to make sure I mentioned yeah. that. And um, yeah. yeah, for folks, if you're listening to this or, um, or viewing this, if you haven't seen that interview with Will Norman, please pop on over and uh, check that out. Uh, so political will, this is huge. T- get, take it away. Yeah. So again, Paris is coming out on top here. And, and as you were saying, it's maybe a bit unfair to, to rank Paris, London, and New York uh, together in this way. Cause as we know, um, Mayor Adams is quite new in post, um, but certainly we, you know, again here, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek, um, healthy rivalry across the three cities, but we really want to congratulate Paris uh, on the the effort made uh, during lockdown um, and also sort of more, more generally. Uh, we've had since 2015, so much happening in Paris from the from the uh, street closures and car free days uh, through to the rise and rollout of cycle lanes across Paris, um, 30 kilometer per hour zones, uh, school streets as well. Um, and now the intention to to remove non-essential traffic from the center of Paris by 2024. Yeah. Um, Mayor Hidalgo has been elected on a platform of of tackling uh, traffic in Paris, um, and she has a lot of support for that. Uh, so I think again, this is this is inspiring. There's obviously more that Paris needs to do, um, but we want to congratulate those efforts and and to see that momentum continue. Yeah, and to and to be really really clear here too. I mean, obviously the mayors are getting a. a a great deal of credit here and we hold the mayors accountable, but, um, in every one of these cities and in your city too, wherever you happen to live, uh, your representatives, your local representatives, uh, are incredibly important. And so making sure that you're communicating, you know, with your, you know, counselors, if that's what they are in, in our area, it's our, our city council members, uh, you making sure that they understand, uh, that having a desirable, high quality of life place, the the message that we deliver is is intentionally. It shouldn't be negative. It shouldn't be this is a war on cars. It should be we want to have a safe and inviting, vibrant, successful, uh, you know, community, and and really honing in on the fact that uh, again. You know, Mayor Hildago isn't doing this because she hates cars. She's doing this because she loves her city and wants to see it be a high quality place. And so holding accountable and having that communication at the local level, at the block level with your 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 representatives uh, so that it flows up to, uh, you know, the mayor, if it happens to be a strong mayor system, uh, Austin, Texas is not a strong mayor system. The the mayor is just, you know, one vote a- across, you know, 11 uh, in the city council. So I just wanted to mention that. Good stuff. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. School streets. Oh, here it is. See, you had a whole section on school streets. I didn't even know. (laughs) Yeah, we've also got a report on school streets. If people are are interested um, on the Car Free Megacities website um, that that, uh, looks into these in London. Um, 
But yeah, so London has done very well uh, in terms of rolling out school streets. Paris as well uh, has rolled out school streets. However, they do not appear to be as well maintained or, or enforced. Um, but certainly the, the reason that school streets are so important is that we want to encourage families and children to feel safe and empowered, uh, to be independent in terms of, of getting from A, A to B, going to school. Um, I think a lot of parents can relate to the fact that, you know, you, when, when you have kids, um, pretty early on, you have to teach them to be very careful about, about traffic. And it's not much fun in our cities. Right. It can be, it, it can really get in the way <laughs> um, and, and be quite a task. So if we can eliminate some of the traffic around schools uh, at pick up and drop off time, really that can empower kids to, to, to be independent um, and, and to feel the, the benefits of, of being able to walk or cycle to school. So a really, really important way uh, to, to set up our, our future change makers. And this is a great metric that I'd like to see completely removed from your, 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 your measurements, because I'd like the entire city to be a kid friendly city and not even having the need to have a program of school streets, because literally the, the, your, your children should be able to have the run of the city and shouldn't have to feel like, oh my gosh, um, you know, there, there's an issue going on here, but uh, even the most kid friendly cities that I know of um, are challenged by this. So the reality is, is that may be the utopian future that John has in mind is that we don't have a need for, uh, for school, school streets and parklets and yeah. all these other ma measurements. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, this is wonderful that, uh, that's also yeah. being considered and, and micro Absolutely. mobility. So obviously we were talking about bike share earlier and e-scooters are also part of that, the equation with micro mobility. It looks like, uh, Paris is, uh, right out front here. You know, it's it's funny because when I was there in 2015, it was before the scooter revolution. It was interesting. The uh, uh, what we saw um, in Paris at the time were scooters, but they were uh, human powered push scooters at the time, which I saw many adults riding, which really shocked me. Uh, but uh, talk a little bit about the, this competition uh, with the, the micro mobility. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think. Um what we what we want to do with the micro mobility information is just to highlight that there are so many different options and so many alternatives to the car um, that if all given their rightful space uh, and rightful place uh, on our streets could really be a game changer. And we're beginning to see that now with e-scooters. Uh, Paris is doing the best. Um, but all three cities are beginning to do more to encourage uh e-scooters and that's something that we we very much support and that we would like to see continued yeah fantastic and then the final drum roll please clean air zones uh what's this all about yeah, so clean air zones are essentially where the most polluting vehicles are either fully restricted from the cities or, or need to pay a fine um, and london has really been a a, a real pioneer uh, in terms of rolling out a uh, low emission zone. It now has an ultra low emission zone, uh, which has been hugely successful. It, initially, it just covered a very small area of the city center. It was then expanded um, 18 times the size, and it's gonna be expanded again in, in 2023. And what we're seeing in London is that over 92% of vehicles are compliant with the scheme. We're seeing the most polluting vehicles being taken off the roads. Uh, that is beginning to have a, an impact on improved air quality. And so really what we can see here is that when measures are introduced to tackle cars, they can yield results. And that is something that we are supportive of and, and that we, we, we want to see more of. Yeah. And, and Paris obviously had a head start. They uh, really initiated theirs about four years ahead of London. So uh, that's uh, probably the reason why they came in first on that uh, metric as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, when we look at this this challenge that we have a, ahead of us and, and this particular um, uh, fun competition, fun challenge between these three cities, uh, what, what's sort of the final thing that you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, I think 
What we are inviting our audience to do is reimagine our cities free from cars. Um, we really want people to think about, you know, whatever city you live in, whether that's Paris, London, New York, uh, or, or anywhere else, what is uh, one of the worst areas for traffic in your city? And how would you like it to look? How would you like it to feel? How would you like it to sound? Um, and, and how would you design it? How would, how would you design it in a way that is equitable and fair for people um, from, from, you know, in terms of their backgrounds, uh, in terms of their mobility needs? There's a lot to be taken into consideration when thinking about going car free. But we do believe that a fairer future for our cities is a car free future. Um, and we want to invite people on that journey with us. We want people to feel empowered and inspired uh, to think of, of alternative futures for our cities because the way that we see it, the future is car free. It's not about whether it's going to happen, but it's about how it's going to happen. And, and that's really exciting. That's something that presents a great deal of opportunity for our cities to be better, to be fairer. Um, and, and we just want to spread that message of, of hope um, and, and of a better future. Uh, so that's really what this campaign is aiming to do. It doesn't all have to be doom and gloom. A car-free future is, is a better future for our cities. Fantastic. And again, that's carfreemegacities.org. It's dot O-R-G. And, and again, uh, you know, possible, uh, wearepossible.org is the parent organization. And to learn more and, and take a look at uh, uh, that organization, again, go to wearepossible.org. Amelia, thank you so very much. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, it's been it's been wonderful to to have the the chat, uh, to have the chance to talk with you, um, and and yeah, looking forward to to tuning in to to all of your future podcast episodes. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Amelia and Car Free Mega Cities. And if you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below, and uh, and be sure to share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that button there. Uh, and be sure to select your notifications preferences. Uh, I'll be back next week with another episode. And so until next time, this is John signing off, wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>